Hey everyone, today we're reviewing the Intel Celeron G6900 CPU. This is the ultimate low end. This is an Intel's Alder Lake architecture family. It is not technically part of the 12,000 series, but it was launched alongside them. The step up from this would be the Pentium. This CPU, however, is the cheapest we could get right now as an available in stock today. It was about 60 to $70, it might be as low as 50. So it's the ultra budget end of DIY CPUs. We expect the Pentium to be far more interesting from a gaming standpoint, but they're hard to get right now. The G7400 would be the one there that we're looking forward to looking at in benchmarks. But today we're gonna to be benchmarking this against the i3s and everything else. Although really we're more interested in how it performs just almost in a vacuum because it could open the door for certain types of PCs, but at two cores, we'll see. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's X570 Dark motherboard. The EVGA X570 Dark is a high-end motherboard for AM4 CPUs, built around extreme overclocking and tested heavily by EVGA's Kingpin. The X570 Dark has a uniquely rotated socket and RAM layout, 90-degree rotated cables for ease of installation and management, and tons of troubleshooting features to make building, testing, and overclocking easier. Check out EVGA's X570 Dark high-end motherboard at the link in the description below. So the pricing for this makes it make sense, or at least somewhat appealing, for maybe an H610 type of motherboard. You don't benefit from the extra dim per channel that you lose if you don't know the differences between H610, H670, B660, so forth. You can check our other video on that. We'll link that in the description below. But this is a good pairing for the cheaper stuff. It makes the most sense for maybe a really lightweight office, like home office type of PC. If you do anything that's Excel intensive, like actually uses Excel more than just some basics, then this will start to struggle with it. If you do really heavy web browsing, a lot of tabs, uh, a lot of 4K video, this is gonna struggle with that too. So the bar is pretty low. Gaming should therefore obviously not be expected to do extremely well on this either. We are going to benchmark a bunch of our games. Uh, so we'll have some easier stuff in there like Rainbow Six Siege or CSGO, and then we'll have the more modern things like Far Cry 6, where you can expect this to fail spectacularly. We'll also be looking at a couple of production applications, but it's not worth going too in depth on them. The very short of it is you should not be buying this for production applications like Photoshop, Premiere, um, a lot of compression, decompression, code compile, things like that. This, this doesn't make any sense, uh, and you should try your hardest to buy something else, even if it's a used Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge CPU of a higher tier class, because you'll get more value there. Anyway, as for the specs, just to set the expectations here, so the G6900 is on what Intel calls Intel 7 lithography, so it's 10 nanometer process node. It just launched. It has two cores and two threads. They are P cores, or performance cores. There are zero E cores on this CPU. It is simply two core, two thread. You haven't seen a two core, two thread CPU on this channel in a really long time. I'm not sure the last time we looked at one was uh, the lowest we've looked at more recently was four core stuff, four core, four thread old i5s. So this is at the ultra low end. It's 3.4 gigahertz to the base frequency. It only has four megabytes of total cache. And then for the IGP, it does actually have integrated graphics. It's got an Intel UHD 710 in it, not to be confused with the NVIDIA GT 710. They are very different. So that's the setup. This is a really basic CPU. Uh, again, the use case for this is not really gaming, but you can game on it. Something like a 2D side-scrolling platformer along those lines should be no problem, unless they do really crazy stuff with effects or, uh, I mean, like you get into Dwarf Fortress and even though it looks simple, it's a lot of CPU load. So a different story for those, but it can do some gaming. We're gonna benchmark that. The Pentium is where we think there will be a lot more interest. Intel has had a really good track record with Pentiums, the, I think it was G3568 or 3258, something like that, was actually an impressive performer for what it was. But that was many years ago, like six or eight years or something like that. I think Scott Watson was still working at Tech Report at the time. So uh, it's been a little while. Pentiums are what we're interested in. Celerons are what's available. Also, really important note for today, we're gonna be doing a lot more frame time plots for this one. So quick recap for you. Uh, the typical graphs we do are bar charts and it shows average 1% and 0.1% low FPS. That gives you an overall recap of the performance in terms of frame rate in a game. But frame time plots show us the frame to frame time required or the frame to frame interval to present using on present a frame to the player. Uh, once that exceeds eight to 12 milliseconds excursion from frame n minus one, so the previous frame, you start to notice it as a player in most instances, certainly 50 milliseconds and higher is bad. So we're gonna look at a lot of frame time plots in this one 
Um, those will tell you the full picture for this thing. We'll start with CSGO benchmarking just because it's one of the few things that a Celeron should reasonably be expected to play, sort of. The Celeron G6900 ran at 91 FPS average. Comparatively, this is bad. The next closest CPU is the R72700X, which still holds a lead of 100% in average FPS and in low performance alike. Now, the G6900 also has some frame time issues that aren't revealed in this plot, but we'll show that in a moment. The i3-12100F is 177% ahead. It's far enough ahead that percentages are now silly. So there's actually really strong value in the upgrade to an i3 instead. It's about two times more money, yes, at $100 to $120 instead of $50 to $70, but it's more than double the performance, and that starts to fade as you get above the i3 price class. The value slides as you get towards the higher end. This would be worth strongly considering if you can stretch the budget up to the $100, $120 i3, if not, the Celeron is technically holding on. We don't foresee its usable life lasting very far in the future and certainly not in sensitive games today, which is most games because two cores is ridiculous for gaming. It's more of an office PC. 1440p doesn't change anything in the Celeron class. So that's expected. This increases GPU load, not CPU load by moving to 1440. However, we're already entirely CPU bound on the CPU, so we remain CPU bound. The result is therefore the same. The increased resolution just means the GPU does a little more work here, but otherwise it's the same story. Here's where it's more interesting. This is the frame time plot. This shows the frame to frame intervals for each frame rendered, measured in milliseconds. Ideally, there's not more than eight to 12 millisecond excursions from frame N minus one, but in this chart, we see several frames that took upwards of 50 milliseconds to complete rendering and then present to the user. This means that there'll be a few hitches in gameplay that the player can definitely feel. So although the average FPS and even the lows looked okay in the charts, a couple of these spikes, if they happen at the wrong time, could still ruin a match for you. That's why collecting frame times is important. 1% and 0.1% lows help, and they do help point us towards potential issues. But this plot is required to explore the issue, and there definitely is one. Up next is Cyberpunk 2077. This one is in stark contrast to CSGO because it didn't run at all. The Celeron is trying to run Cyberpunk, and when it tried to run it, it looked kind of like this. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get past the menu screen and into the buggy gameplay, but upon loading the levels to our save game files, we were presented with a black screen, and then it stopped. The Celeron gets a failing grade here. It ran at zero FPS average, also just zero FPS period, DNF. Far Cry 6 at 1080p also had problems with the Celeron. It just wasn't able to keep up, and the CPU was loaded at 100%. The lack of available resources led to constantly dropping frames and extended frame render times. With a 14 FPS average and 6 FPS 0.1% low, the frame time plot when we get to it will look completely unplayable. This CPU isn't even worth thinking about if you want to play games like this, although it maybe seems okay for some lighter weight games if you're on an extreme budget. Some of the modern indie titles or games that are maybe 2D platformer style. No problem for most of those. But Far Cry 6 is too much. Far Cry 6 frame times are insane. In this chart, you can see them bouncing between about 40 and 90 milliseconds for most of the range, but the excursions to 160 and 180 milliseconds are bad. The regular spikes to 100 to 120 milliseconds mean that if the 14 FPS average didn't already prove it, this game is completely unplayable on the CPU. Let's go back to something that Celeron is more capable of handling. In Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p, the Celeron averaged 119 FPS average on its two cores and threads, with the lows distant at 26 FPS 0.1%. The lows are important here because although they look a lot better than Far Cry, the bars illustrate how disproportionate the scaling is from other CPUs on the plot. We're always looking for relative performance from one CPU to another, and in this example, the Celeron looks great with its 120 FPS average, considering the price that is, but it teeters on territory of being unplayable due to the frame time inconsistency. The i3-12100F quadruples the average frame rate while also pulling the lows up to better territory for competitive gaming. It's amazing actually how much scaling there is here because the Celeron is low enough in the stack that almost anything will show a non-linear improvement in a good way, and we're seeing that with the i3. We're also seeing that with the older CPUs like the R5-3600 and similar, basically everything. Uh, so. It is impressive, we want to be clear, that the Celeron can hit the averages it's hitting here. It's just the average isn't the only aspect of testing. Here's the frame time plot to sort of help that. In this one, the frame times are overall actually pretty good, except for sharp spikes to 40 milliseconds plus when they happen. 
They happen somewhat regularly, unfortunately, but they don't seem to map to any particular in-game action. The plot isn't nearly as bad as Far Cry 6, and this game can be played on the Celeron, but you may want to tune some settings down to try and reduce the frequency or the rate of occurrence of these spikes. F1 2021 is another game that's easy to run. Looking at this chart, you can see that most of our high-end CPUs are running into a GPU bottleneck. There's no useful data to be had on the top half of the chart, so we can't differentiate between one CPU and the next when they're bouncing off of a limit. The lower half remains useful, though. The Celeron G6900 runs at 100 FPS average. This looks great as an average, again, but it struggles in the lows. It's the same story repeated as last time. The i3-12100F would be a significant, meaningful, and most importantly, noticeable upgrade in almost all scenarios involving more than a very low-end game. This is in contrast to the, say, 12100F and the 12400, where although the 12400 is better, the advantage becomes a little bit more subjective and less immediately obvious to all users. We'll go back to GTA V for an older school look at performance. Even when this game came out for PC, it was uncommon to have a two-core CPU for a gaming machine. Four cores was the most common at the time. The Celeron ran at 54 FPS average, but had dismal lows. Sadly, it's unplayable with our settings. You could maybe tune it down, but our goal is to review a product in a standard environment, not make things just work on it. Anything on this chart would be better. Maybe somewhat shockingly, Total War Three Kingdoms actually did okay in average FPS. We test this game with high settings, which tends to be somewhat abusive on the GPU. Uh, at the high end of the chart, it is hard for the CPUs and the memory, but it depends on sort of the architecture you're testing with and the range of FPS we're in. This isn't anywhere near the top of the chart, so we don't need to worry about the GPU or the memory being bottlenecks. The averages held on okay overall, but the story is the same, and we'll stop here for games since the pattern is clear. Moving to production applications, we'll start with Blender Cycles tile-based rendering. The Celeron required 113 minutes to complete the render, whereas the next slowest CPU in the current data set we have required 31 minutes. The i3 reduced render time by 73%, so you shouldn't plan on really doing any rendering work on the Celeron. It's not usable for this. It's very painful. Uh, you might have a cheap or old GPU line around. That'll be better than this is for tile-based rendering. You'd be better off pushing to CUDA or OpenCL. While compiling the Chromium code base, we measured a 440-minute time requirement to complete the compile. This isn't obviously the only type of compile that exists. Some of them are more cache-heavy, some are more core-heavy or frequency-heavy, but it gives us a pretty well-rounded look. The 12100F reduces compile time by 70%, making its relatively slow prior result now look lightning fast. Again, the Celeron isn't a CPU that should be used in production work really at all. You'd be better off buying a used system for this kind of work. Something like an Ivy Bridge system with an old i7 would do a lot better than this. Adobe Premiere Benchmarking has the G6900 scoring 220 points in aggregate, a combined score determined by calculating the filtering, the transforms, the warps, the saves, live scrubbing, playback, and rendering performance. The CPU is unusable for this task. It's not even close to useful. It'd be okay for some web browsing, but it struggles with video playback, especially in this capacity. We actually had to modify our Adobe Premiere benchmark just to run on the CPU. When we first ran it, the software kept quitting and giving up due to timeouts, so we had to extend those timeout periods to accommodate it. So wrapping up then, we basically already told you what we thought right in the beginning. This thing, you know, it's a fantastic lesson and why average FPS alone isn't enough. The industry has learned this at this point, so it's not news, but it is a good reminder. Uh, because in CSGO, it looked pretty good. The average was great for what it is. The 0.1% lows, which are an average, by the way, it's just it's an average of the lower uh, end of the chart. And the 0.1% lows still looked okay as a bar. They're disproportionate, yes, versus the other CPUs, but they looked okay. Then you look at the frame time plot and the picture comes together where it looks okay up to a point and then maybe once every, let's say, probably every... 20, 30 seconds while you're playing CSGO, uh, at least, maybe 15, you're going to see some kind of hitch, depending on what's going on in the game. The more action there is, the more effects there are, the more likely you are to run into problems with it, especially the CPU-bound effects. So the frame time pacing with this CPU is really not good in pretty much any of the games we've tested. Uh, it's sort of acceptable in maybe two games that we tested. That was it. And our CPU benchmarks are skewed towards the higher end. That's where we focus, so we leave room so that high-end CPUs can differentiate themselves in the chart, as well as down to about an i3, 
maybe an R3 or an APU, but we don't typically plan for Celeron class stuff. You can see where it falls relative to everything else. So you get some percent scaling there versus an i3. An i3 is a massive step up and one that you know, typically we're pretty conservative about recommending people spend more money than maybe they set out to when they're watching a video because we really focus on value and what benefits the average consumer or buyer of a product. And truthfully, as we all know, as we've talked about in our videos, the difference between something like an i7 and an i9, or even an i5-12400 and an i9, for a lot of people, if you're doing a gaming PC, although it's measurable, and it may even be perceptible to a lot of players in competitive games or something like that, or certainly in production workloads, a lot of the time the value just isn't there. It, it makes sense if you have a lot of money, but for people who feel more constrained by their budget, they shouldn't be outstretching what they can comfortably afford because there are more important things in life that you need to have money available for to pay for. And so an i5-12400 or an R5-5600X, something like that, is more than good enough. It is, those are great CPUs. But once you get down to the Celeron level, it starts to deteriorate a little bit. The value increase to an i3-12100F at about $100-$120, so it's about two times the price, but you are dealing with lower numbers here, so it doesn't maybe it doesn't hurt as much. That difference, you're quadrupling in your frame rate, but more importantly, it's not just about going 4X or whatever. It's about going from unplayable or unusable on things like Blender, Premiere, Photoshop, uh, gaming, to usable, and a pretty good experience. So this is one of the few instances where we would recommend trying to scrap together a little bit more money if you're building a gaming PC or anything that's gonna do any type of production. The Celeron might have a place. It's not really in our lab. That doesn't mean it has no use. It's just we don't particularly test for basic office function type computers. Office means small home office. Uh, I don't know, like maybe a dental office or something like that. I don't know what kind of workload those machines go through. But if it's something like appointment booking, this will be able to handle that if it's just a web interface or something like that. It's not going to be able to run a lot of tabs. It'll struggle with high-end video. It'll struggle with doing a lot of things at once. But if all you need to do is open a web browser and make calendar appointments, it's fine. Uh, but that's so far away from what we do as a core business that I, we have trouble, I have trouble uh, sort of bridging the gap, making the recommendation. So the recommendation we would make for our core audience and my team's core competence would be uh, if you are trying to build a gaming PC, something that could do lightweight production, simple games, probably consider the Pentium, but wait for a review on it if we can get it. Look at the i3. If that's out of reach, that's fine. You don't have to stretch for it, but maybe consider a used system as well. It's not like the GPU market where used CPUs are atrociously expensive. They've actually gotten a lot better. Uh, so if you're looking at something like Sandy Bridge is getting pretty long on the tooth. That would be the 2000 series Intel CPUs, but some of them are still pretty good, 2600K, for example. Maybe look at an Ivy Bridge or Haswell. So it'd be 3000, 4000 series. They lack some modern features. Uh, they're not as power efficient as modern CPUs, but the performance jump is insane. And you should be able to get some of those, especially if they're in pre built at decent prices. So consider that route, uh, something like a 2700 would be a great consideration. It's 2600X, 2600, really anything in the last few years at the lower end is going to be better than this. So um, this is the type of CPU where the answer to is it worth upgrading is almost anything is better. So that's it for this one. Very simple at the end of the day. Uh, basically don't buy it unless you really have to. And we'll be back with a Pentium review hopefully soon. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus as well if you'd like to support us directly. And if you go to the store, you can grab something like the mod mats that I have in front of me. This is a PC building work surface. It is anti-static conductive for you to work on your components, keep them safe, and the surface you're working on protected as well while you work on uh, components that have a bunch of metal sticking out of them, like the back of a motherboard. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.